Right everyone, I'm going to start off with three trick questions. Now they are trick questions, so please answer them so there's not silence, right? So, first of all, what, who are the enemy of the samurai? The ninja, yeah? Absolutely incorrect. Samurai are the enemy of the samurai, right? Because what pe most people don't realise is that ninja are actually from the samurai class. They were not a separate entity at all. They were from the samurai class. And what do ninjas wear on their face? A black mask, yeah? There is absolutely zero evidence anywhere for the use of a black mask in any of the documentation, anywhere. That comes about later when thieves started to steal into people's houses and they would wear black masks and they got associated with the ninja. Because at that time the ninja were low on their look and they needed some cash. But actually in the time we're thinking about, no, they're not used. Now and lastly, and to crush everybody's hearts, what do ninja throw? Shurikens. Yeah, Death Stars, shurikens. Again, there's almost, there's one example of shuriken, just one in all the manuals. Now, they do exist, they definitely exist, but they don't become connected to the ninja until about the 20th century. So they are there, but ninjas were throwing gas bombs, smoke, um, um, fire, arson, Greek fire, they had all this. So they were throwing cool stuff, but just not throwing stars. Now, I want to take you back on a journey. We'll go back to the 1500s, maybe uh, 1400s Japan. And the samurai at that time are becoming very, very um, aristocratic. They're becoming very ritualistic and they're losing touch with the farmers. So a second level of samurai emerge, a much harder, robust amount of people. And they say, we're going to take control from the elite samurai. And this creates a massive war. And inside of that war, this is where the ninja spring up. Everybody needs these commando spy, these ninja agents. So today we're really thinking about the 14 and 1500s really. Now, you've got to imagine the mountains of Japan, the hills of Japan, the mist. And in the hills, the samurai are inside their residences. And the call to war goes out. One, the lord wants to go to war with another lord. So what he does is he hires some ninja. He hires these from a place called Iga and Koka. These are the famous place for ninja. These are where the guys, the samurai there, are the best. They are superb. Now, uh, so what you get is something called shinobi no mono. That is ninja. Shinobi is made of um, two ideograms that come together. It's made of blade and heart. And when you get a blade and a heart together, it means endurance, perseverance, somebody who can push through the impossible. But it also has a second meaning of hidden, secret, deceptive. So what you get is these two come together and it means someone who's secret, who's hidden, but who can go through difficult times. So what we get there is what we need now. Let me get some water chaps. Now, the enemy lord, he'll be, he'll be there, he'll get his team of ninja, and he'll say, right, I need you guys to be propaganda agents. You guys go to the enemy territory, start spreading rumours. Say that general's cheating on them. Say he's doing this. Start making discord between the troops. Then, what he'll do is he'll send a sleeper agent in. The sleeper agent goes in and he gets a job near the castle town, and he starts working there maybe two or three years beforehand, so that he's got, he gets known by all the people and also he will speak their dialect so he starts to study their dialect now then you get a really high ranking retainer who pretends to leave he pretends to argue with his lord and he goes to the enemy and he says I will work for you I'm a top tactician let me work for you so the enemy say yeah yeah your fame will have you you're really good but in truth he's actually working for his original side and his job is to change the plans for the worst for the enemy now so we've got our team, we've got our shinobi set up and what they do is the army goes on the march, it sets off, it's ready and it gets to a plane where it's going to meet the other army. Now the two armies camp up, they put their bamboo fences up, they dig their trenches and their moats and you get no man's land. Now no man's land here becomes a game of cat and mouse. The ninjas on each side are chasing each other away, they're listening for night raids, they're checking, they're setting traps. Now what we get also, is we also get some shinobi sent to the enemy castle. And their job, here's the big boss man, their job is to go and look at the enemy castle. Because in the end, once they've got past the, the 
in the field formation, they need to break through the enemy castle. So what they'll be using is they'll be using trigonometry to check the height of the castle. They'll be using ropes and measure the moats. They'll check the distance of the moats. They'll look at um, trajectories and arcs of fire. And they have to record all this. They also have to record the topography of the land, where the rivers are. They have to make sure they record all this. And they start streaming this information back to HQ and the command. So what happens then is uh, the rest are with the army. The other shinobi are with the main army. And what they do is they travel alongside the normal troops. Now they get their own billets. They don't have to do any jobs in the day. They simply sleep all day, relax in the sun. And what they do is at night time, they go out and they will infiltrate the no man's land and check. So we're on, let's get back to where we were. We're on the field of battle, yeah? The two camps are opposite each other and uh, the shinobi are playing a cat and mouse game. They're listening, what they're listening for is the neighing of horses at night. If horses are neighing at night more than normal, it means the enemy are preparing for a night raid. So they'll do fake night raids to keep everybody on their toes. Now, um, what we get here is the shinobi divide into two separate types of um, infiltrator. You get smelling agents and listening agents. The smelling agents take up position downwind and they'll wait for the smell of the fuses of the enemy's guns. And when they can smell that, they'll ring bells or pull on ropes to make sure that the people back at camp all wake up, everybody gets going. Or the listening ones are listening for the idea of horses feet, uh, jangling armour. So what they do is they actually tie everything down and the horses muzzles, they actually, sorry, bits, they will wrap in paper, wet paper to keep them from making noises. So everybody's on edge listening. But what happens is they do this night after night after night with fake raids until the enemy are just absolutely tired of being woke up in the middle of the night. And then when you're ready, you strike and you go in. But, but this is how they'll do it. So what happens is, a shinobi will go, he'll get close to the watch fires and he'll be listening for passwords. And he'll find those passwords. And when the enemy come out on a night attack, they'll go out. What happens is, there's confusion. So as the enemy are running out, that shinobi, dressed like the enemy, will walk inside. And he will have to say the password to get in through the gate. And he will have to say the password to get in through the gate because everybody's looking for these agents. But with everybody moving in and out, it's easy for him to get in. The night raid goes out and there's a night raid. The two armies clash in the middle. And what happens is on one side, you've got two or three, four, five shinobi actually fighting with the army. And what they do is change sides halfway through and change. And when that battle is finished, they say, come on, let's go home, chaps. And they go back into the enemy camp with the enemy. Now, there, are, there is protocol to actually stop that. And one of the protocols is that as, the, as you're retreating, you give a command word. It can be anything like mountains, moon, banana, whatever. Everybody drops down to their knees. And anybody who doesn't know the command word, those shinobi, kill him. And everybody every just knifes him. Like, down they go. So that's why everybody's listening for passwords first. That's why you need people in the enemy camp. Um, so, right. Um, so what happens is these shinobi have got into the enemy camp, they have secret letters stitched into their kimono. If I forget to tell you what that's about, at the end, say Anthony, secret letters, explain that. But they have it stitched in here, but they also have secret letters around arrows. And what happens is when they get into the enemy camp, they'll drop these all over the place, these, these letters and these secret arrows. And they actually have um, on them, they say, oh, you're the general such and such is going to defect on this day. We'll pay you this much money and all that. And anybody who finds one will say, oh, one of our generals is defecting. One of our generals is actually accepting bribes. So that's the idea of separating the people. But, but let's get back to it. We're in the middle of the camp. The shinobi are in there, set fire. The fires go up. The other army attack and they come in. They break through the bamboo fences. They fill the moats in. They get across and everybody has a battle. At this point, the shinobi, the ninja on the inside, has to lie in a ditch somewhere and hide and be like, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. And he has to basically try and survive. And then when he survived, he gets out, reports back to his master, they've killed everybody. They're like, right, we've got rid of this section of the force. We need to move on to the castle. Now the castle has the remainder of the force in. So what happens then 
is they use their information on topography, on the land, on the castle, and they go up and they surround the castle for a siege. And at this point, what you're actually waiting for is remember when we have a hidden agent there, don't we? He's been there two years. And we also have the enemy, somebody who's clever, who's gone to the enemy, is actually on the command group, or at least in the area. That's why samurai have something called generational retainers. Those whose families have been with them for generation after generation, they are their close people. Anyone else who's only just arrived gets the second tier level. Now, what happens is the ninja, especially in here, it gets really complicated, guys, at some bits. But we have to calculate the moon set and moon rise. And the shinobi are waiting for a night when the moon sets. And when the moon set, it goes totally dark. Have you ever been outside in the bright moonlight where you're in the countryside? It is mega bright. So what they do is they wait for the moon to go down. It's still night time. And then they, they get ready. Now, in here, he's actually, the man who wrote this, didn't put the... Um, magic talismans in but ninja have loads of magic one of the things they do is actually pick up a live venomous viper and pull its teeth out live and they put the teeth in the hair with special uh, incantations and this gives their team invisibility or they will they will strike um, some some wood carve it down and make a hairpin when the moon is in an eclipse and they, they encapsulate darkness into the moon and they use this hairpin and they are, they're blessed by the gods and darkness and in they go. That, that's the ritualistic side of it. The actual side is they wait for the moon to go down until it's pitch black and they take metal spikes and they put the metal spikes in the walls and they'll climb up the castle on the inside of a shadow. Then they'll grappling hook over the top, they'll get in, jump onto the inside and what they have to do then is wait for the patrol. Now the patrol is a light patrol first and they have a torch coming through. And these are searching for shinobi everywhere. But second is the dark patrol. These are other shinobi who are searching on the inside for enemy shinobi. So a ninja will have to watch. And as the light patrol goes past, you see, then he waits and listens and smells. Dark patrol goes past, now I can go in. And he will go in. But do you remember how I said there's no masks? We know that because the Ban Senshukai says, this book says, when somebody comes across, Japanese sleeves are quite long. So you have to cover your face with the sleeve and it stops the moon or starlight or whatever's there, torchlight reflecting on your face. Excuse me. So, um, right, so we're inside the castle. What you've got to remember is that Probably they've been given a map of the castle by the enemy, uh, by the shinobi on the inside. So they've already got this information. They know exactly where they're going. In fact, one of the skills is mental infiltration. You infiltrate mentally beforehand, that like in like you know Ocean's Eleven and everything, where they all sit there and, and watch it. It's exactly what the ninja did. And what they do is now you get something called in and yo, which is yin and yang. So we're all familiar with yin and yang. So in is yin, which is dark. Yo is light, uh, which is yang. <coughs> now, in, in darkness, means those when they're creeping in. Yo means you're out in the open. It means I'm dressed as a merchant or I'm dressed as a farmer. or I, You know, you can see me, but I've got a hidden agenda. So in this case, the shinobi uses something called bakimono no jutsu, which is the art of the changeling. Now, what they do is they change all their tags. They change all the little bits, and they've got identifying marks and it's everything that the enemy have. Even sometimes down to the sword cord, they have different colours so that the groups fit together. And if they don't have the same sword cord colour, you're like, he's an enemy. So what they do is they have to check all this beforehand, get it going, and this is the changeling skill. Then they go in and they switch back to in nin, which is dark ninjutsu, and they'll crawl in. They get inside something like the gunpowder storage and they'll set light to it, boom! Obviously they'll run away first. The gunpowder will go up, or if not, they'll get to somewhere that's flammable, like the stores or the roofs. And what happens is the, um, the army inside the castle have to divide then. You can't have your castle burning down. There is no way you can keep a siege going with their castle being destroyed. So they divide the forces. What happens here then is outside, the ninja's lord will now attack. He only has half the forces to deal with. And they start scaling the walls, smashing it down, and they start destroying everything. And that's how the ninja are used to sort of take a castle down. Now, 
So what we've got is the fall of, what I've just took you through there is the fall of the enemy castle, the fall of an enemy force, and this is through intelligence, propaganda, surveillance and infiltration. It's a massive network. They reckon, well I'm going to guess because of certain documents we've found, there's roughly about 50 ninja work for each province. So a lord, a decent lord will have about 50 agents working for him. Some in secret, some hidden, all over the place. These are constantly working and they're paid quite well in the warring periods. So it was good to be a ninja. But we did know many died. In fact, 75 died at one point trying to climb the walls and they were getting shot down. So they actually had to give them iron shields to crawl up walls with because they were getting killed. But what happens then in 1600s Japan, the wars end. It's the market falls out of ninjutsu. Nobody can afford ninjas anymore. They don't need them anymore. So what they do is they drop the amount from, say, 50 to 20. And you can see this in the records. It drops down. And what happens then is you get the, the, the ninja families start to lose their income. And they can't be full-time professional ninjas then. So they start farming. They start losing their samurai status. Everything starts going down. Now, about 1676, there's a man called Fujibayashi. And he writes... He writes this, guys. This is not the original. I wish it was. This is actually just a copy. This is a facsimile. And he sits down 70 years after and he writes not just the sort of history of the ninja, but everything you need to know about being a ninja. He writes landmines, explosives, torches, uh, flamethrowers. Yeah, he's got, he's got it all. And he goes through everything. Goes through so to be honest, some of it is a little bit difficult because it's astronomical charts and me and, me and Watkins when we did this, we had the editors, we had months of like looking at charts and dying, but he decided to get it all down. Now this is the same as us today, it's 70 years after the war, so that's 70 years after World War II, it's like us writing about World War II, but these are actually ninja families writing their stuff down. This manual gets distributed across all the ninja families, becomes really famous and then the ninja are so, so poor that they go to the, um, the shogun of Japan, the leader of Japan, not directly to him, but to one of his you know, representatives and say, look, this is what we have, this is how we're represented, we need more money to carry on with ninjas. But by the way, Bansen Shukai, is me Bansen Shukai means many rivers come into one ocean. And it means all the ninja skills of Iga and Koga come together and we collect it. Now what happens then, it sort of disappears into the Japanese archives till the 1950s and then it sort of reappears again and starts getting published and published and then uh, I was born in 1978 and the curse of the ninja community and I went to Japan and my goal is to make the ninja history correct that's what I want to do and we're doing it through Watkins and we're also doing Book of the Samurai which is another story which I'll talk to you about next time and we're trying to correct the samurai history now ninja history is absolutely incorrect 100% incorrect in the, uh, the fact that in the 20th century just lots of fake things were put out in Japan and it got put to England now the samurai history is not incorrect but it's a little bit skewed with the romanticism it's the same as when we used to think knights were brave and honourable and they rescued maidens so it's the same as samurai, it's pretty, pretty horrific so what I'm going to do now, I'll let, I've started with three trick questions, yeah, I'm going to end with a trick question to give you an idea of the Japanese military principles for keeping a straight mind. So I'll give you a choice. You can either eat a cake or you can eat a, gla uh, a cup of shattered glass. Which one do you want to eat? Trick question. <laughs> you have a choice. Which one? The answer is none, you have a choice. Yeah, you have a choice to eat none of them because eating glass will be horrible for you. But we all know eating cake kills you equally. Everybody dies of heart disease. Everybody knows cake is not good for you. At any point has cake ever been good for you? But people keep cramming it in, myself included. The point here is something called principle of heaven and mind of man. Principle of heaven is the angel on this shoulder. The mind of man is the devil on this shoulder. In psychology, it's called dual, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dual dialogue, the twin dialogue of you had in your head. Now, ninjas are technically originally samurai. Now, that is a bit of a broad statement, but on the whole, they drop in status, but they can cross all walks of life. But we're looking mainly at the samurai agents here. Now, they have to keep a moral compass correct, absolutely correct, but they have to do really devious things. Like, for example, if they want to know what the enemy are, 
stocks are like in the castle, when they kill someone who's come out, they open up the stomach and they pull out the contents and check what they're eating. They will literally murder people and replace them with other people. They will do the most disgusting things you have ever thought of, but they have to keep the principle of heaven over the mind of man. So in everybody's mind, it's, a, it's an argument between these two. And ninjas had to struggle that with the most. So guys, I'm at, at this moment in time, we've got the Bans and Shukai out. I'm on this crusade to correct ninja history. And we're here, and it's uh, time with um, Watkins. And we're all going forward, and we're trying to do it. And hopefully, we'll get there in the end. But thank you very much for your changes. So in the, at first, you're going to be smelling for humans. You're going to be smelling for like leather on the oil, anything like that. But it's about 1550s, roughly, about the mid-1500s, that guns get to Japan and they become the biggest manufacturers of guns in the world. In fact, the samurai were famous for guns. They've just got hammered all the guns out. So yeah, by that point, they used to have waterproof fuses for matchlock rifles. And uh, they, they, it was two, it was the uh, Portuguese, I think, who came across. And um, what they did is it landed, they traded them with the Japanese, and the Japanese was like, make them, make them, make them. So do, uh, I didn't reiterate really the question, I apologize. So yeah, that, yeah, guns, in fact, you can see many, many, uh, nice uh, mother of pearl guns in Japan in many museums. In fact, Christians are in Japan at this time. In fact, there's a big Christian community. One of the last samurai battles, in fact, the last samurai battles, is a massive Christian community, Japanese samurai Christian community. So you've got lots of Western influence. This idea of Japan being isolated is only later on. The motivation for ninja to keep what, doing what they're doing, right. Basically, why were the ninja motivated? It was just a, uh, a feudal system. It was all based on military order. It was all based on land grabbing. So before this time I'm talking about, it was pretty much a peaceful part of Japanese history. But here, everybody was grabbing land. So those at the top in power were just out for more power. And they just hired the ninja, and yeah, the ninja were literally. All, basically, all samurai, all retainers in Japan are based on agriculture. So you're a samurai, you're given X amount of land, it produces X amount of rice, and you cash that in for X amount of cash. And that's how it all works. It's all like a farmer warrior society. They don't literally go out and dig the ground, but they run farms. The hierarchy in Japan is based on two, two lines. The imperial line, they are the original rulers, the emperor of Japan. He's still there today, the family. They all argue about if it's the right, you know, the lineage. But the emperor of Japan is still there. But he's more of a religious head. You can see him as the person who leads the country spiritually. But the shogun, which is the military dictator, has taken ownership from them. It happened about a thousand years ago and they took ownership from them. So for anything spiritual, or the, the emperor even has to say who can look after the country of Japan, who is the military leader, the dictator. But a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the family histories were fudged for that reason and they did the ritual and they just carried on. So actually Japan is run by the most powerful military commander there is. And, the, uh, and they look after the emperor. Absolutely. So the modern day equivalent of the ninja, without doubt, is James Bond. James Bond is so popular because he is. And if you notice, ninja are popular, James Bond is popular for the very same reason. If you think about SAS and Navy SEALs, they're the guys who dress, they cover their faces in black, go in with weapons, boot the door down and kill everything. The spy is the guy who's the mega spy who's calculating and he's very clever. James Bond mixes both. The ninja mix both. Actually, the ninja divided into two sets. You've got people who are very clever who did that. So it's like today, you would get ninja who are the MI5, MI6 guys, and you would get ninja who are the SAS guys. And there is a slight overlap in the middle. But you would get, yeah. so sometimes, lower, socially lower people who had less education would be the crawl in there, knife everyone, and we're done. Whereas the people who are going in doing secret codes, talking about political movements, propaganda, they're quite high level, well-educated Oxford boys who are, you know, going around in the circles, spreading propaganda. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. Uh, why is the ninja history basically wrong? Don't worry, ninja stars do exist. I'm, I'm, I've had to like bring people round off the floor before now, you know. It's, they do exist, but what happens is they're just a secret weapon used in normal samurai schools. So you would pull one out, normally they're straight, and you'd throw them at the enemy, and then you draw a sword and you go in and kill. And that, they, they use more of distraction. I think distraction is a bit of a loose term because it's like a six inch nail being thrown at you at high velocity. It's not that, you know, it's a bit more than distracting. But what happened is 
when the ninja died, they still died out. Sorry, they still became. There was lots of novels in the late samurai period about ninja and picture books and you know fantasy. And by the 1910s, 1920s, you've got films where ninja are magicians, and a ninja is a magician in the early 1900s. Then. By about 1930, 1940, 1950, he becomes this super comic character. They start adding the shuriken, the flips, the back flips, and the superhuman stuff. And then comics boom in Japan, films boom in Japan. And what happens is, is ninjas boomed in 1980s through James Bond first, and then through, do you remember Shogun, the program, Shogun? They boomed through that. And then, of course, Karate Kid. And Japanese culture was massive in the 80s. So what they did is they went to Japan, got all the books, translated them, published them, but basically they were publishing half comic, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of a mixture, and it's just, even Japan now, I have done a talk like this to the people of Japan on the ninja, and they still, after all the talk, get somebody dressed as a ninja to throw plastic shuriken about. You're like, oh, I'm in Japan and they're even doing it here. I, I'm trying to get rid of that image, but it's a hard, long slog. I was like, let's get Yoshi. So me and Yoshi did it, and I did um, archaeology at MA level, so I did the history side, and of course I have to go through the script and we go through everything. She changes it to basic English, well basic is a bit of a loose term again, but and then I, we clean it up and we go through word by word what it means. And that's how we go, and that's what that basically is from this. So it's you and Yoshi? Yeah, it's definitely me and Yoshi. I say.